Okay. Uh, so uh, SES descends from uh, a lot of object capability language work and a lot of work that I've done uh, in particular on uh, getting JavaScript to support it. Um, and that's me. Uh, Sala. Oh, uh, yeah, well, Guy knows me. Uh, I'm kind of oh. um, doing a lot of experimental work, uh, but I'm also working with Guy uh, on modules. Uh, yes. um, and basically, I come from the printing world, uh, where I have stopped being like involved in the production realm uh, and focused a lot on research uh, related to image processing and trying to create this uh, image processing ecosystem um, that uses JavaScript purely um, and taking it very, very slowly, I guess. OK, Guy. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me on here. Thanks. It's great to yeah, discuss. Yeah, we're still, we're still doing introductions. I'm sorry. OK, sure. Uh, so yeah, I've um, been working on, on modules for quite a while. Uh, create the, the module loader system JS. Also been working on a project called JSPM for many years. Uh, and uh, I started working with Bradley on the modules integration into Node. Uh, well, just over two years ago now, I think. Uh, and uh, yeah, that sort of has grown into what we have now um, as more and more people have got involved. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I've also got more involved in the Node.js project as well from that side. So I do a lot of open source, and then I do consulting to kind of subsidize it and, and make it work as a, as a lifestyle. Um, yeah, so that's. OK, uh, Kate. Hi, I'm Kate. Um, I work at Agoric as a smart contract developer. Um, previously, I've just been um, kind of a, a Node developer, um, but my interest has been more towards the smart contract side. and so I'm. I've been learning more about the internals of, uh, of JavaScript and the internals of Node and things like that. Okay, uh, Daria. Uh, I'm currently a PhD student. I'm working on, uh, well, overall, it, I'm working on language-based security. And in particular, I'm working on a programming language called Wyvern, which is capability-based. And uh, we have developed a module system uh, using capabilities. Okay, Richard. Um, Richard Gibson, currently with Oracle. And um, I kind of fell into this group just from mutual interest. Um, I have no direct work at the moment with object capability, but uh, appreciate it as a model and really hope to see JavaScript compatibility. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, so Guy, uh, you have the floor. Great. And just to get an idea, um, how much time should we try and keep it to? Um, I mean, I, I probably won't take very long to go through it. Um, but if, if there's any time box, do, do just let me know. Um, OK. So there's not, there, the, um, the only hard limit is the full meeting, the two hours. Um, there okay. are some other things I would like to discuss today. Um, sure. Uh, so, you know. OK. No, well, if very long at all, I'm sure. So you'll have okay. lots of time to discuss uh, other things as well. Uh, okay. Yeah, I can to just dive into the background on this. Um, uh, we've, we've got this new PR up on on Node at the moment, which is going to, which is basically the the combination of our work in the modules group, which Salah has also been involved with, and this is kind of getting to the point now where it's it's ready to merge into master and be released with node 12 and we've kind of worked it to go with the the node 12 deadline release date and this is still flagged under an experimental modules flag but the goal is that this kind of works towards the main major changes that we want to have in place on core for when we unflag and release finally after all these years uh, es uh, module support in node.js and uh, so there's, there's a number of things um, that are being done that are going to set new conventions uh, in terms of how people use modules in Node and therefore what modules they publish on NPM as well and how those NPM modules behave. So this very much sets the conventions by which 
everything else will effectively follow. Uh, semantics that no publishers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the semantics and all their properties are quite important because the semantics that we get in place now are the semantics that get all the convention and community convention ecosystem usage on and the, basically the semantics that we'll be stuck with and we'll never be able to change. Um, as an example, um, I believe in IO, uh, they previously tried to deprecate the buffer global and it turned out that this wasn't possible at all because of the amount of common JS packages on NPM that were using this buffer global. So, uh, and it might have been, uh, I believe that's the exact details, but I might be wrong on that. But the, the point is that um, once you have uh, these things being used with, with such a huge amount of um, usage and reliance in the wild, uh, you can't change them. And so there, there's the opportunity here in the shift to ES modules to possibly uh, deprecate the process and buffer globals. And it's an opportunity that we won't necessarily have again, uh, because once people start writing ECMAScript modules and publishing them to NPM and relying on them working in Node 12 whenever the experimental modules flag is removed, uh, then it's, it, we're, we're stuck with it. So uh, it's kind of one of the, the side semantics of modules that would be nice from a security perspective if we can possibly remove these. Um, now that is a difficult thing to do because V8 doesn't actually allow us to use a different global uh, in ECMAScript modules than from common JS modules. And it doesn't look like we're gonna get that functionality soon. So it's been quite hard to craft something that can provide this support. And uh, in the end, it's ended up, I actually originally uh, did something quite similar to what the Realm Shim does, uh, where they, I was just trying to look for that PR earlier. Uh, I couldn't find it now, uh, but I can possibly share the link afterwards, where it sort of does a, a with global and then creates a separate global for common JS modules than is exposed to ES modules by doing a kind of a wrapper for the common JS case. Yeah, the key, uh, thing is, the key thing is to do the width not on the new global itself, but onto a proxy that reflects things onto the global. Yes, so that, that was the, I believe that was the approach. I think it was a width proxy. Um, I, yeah, the, the PR is there, it was working, and the, the approach was able to achieve this goal of making sure that you couldn't access them in, in the ES module case, and only in the common JS case you would get access to them. Because okay. common JS modules are already wrapped, um, but there was uh, a lot of um, a lot of objections to that, that approach. Um, yeah, I still can't see it here anyway. It, it should be um, one of these PRs. Um, but basically, the objection was this approach will be too slow uh, because we're doing this proxy lookup, and uh, also. Some okay. concerns about changing the wrapper of CommonJS. Okay, well, let me let me let me interrupt you here. The yeah. um, you you were using the proxy lookup in order to implement this on Node as it is now. Were you proposing that the proxy lookup continue to be the way that it works, or were you just using that to shim something that would be supported more directly? So the proxy would be used in all common JS modules as the approach. And uh, uh, then the new ECMAScript modules would get the normal global. But yes, all, com all common JS modules would always have to use a proxy in, in that approach. So that, that, that you were kind of stuck with this proxy. And I think there were a lot of concerns about that. And also changing the wrapper because there's even code that relies on the things like how the, the wrapper behaves exactly. So even at that semantic level, there might be concerns. So, so first of all, let me, let me say that, that um, actually having the proposal be that node in production uses the proxy mechanism to do the isolation um, I, I sympathize with the concern 
um, and you know, hope that by proposing something and getting it accepted, we can get a deeper direct support for it. Um, uh, as, as a you know, platform provided mechanism. Um, uh, Bradley has a proposal before the committee to revise um, the, um, essentially the do a little refactoring on the uh, specification around globals and evaluation uh, in order to create a spec structure that can be extended to accommodate multiple globals and multiple evaluators that evaluate in the scope of different globals. Yeah, so we certainly, if we, if we get first class support for these kind of changes in future, uh, you know, that, that would certainly be a path. And then ideally, um, these kind of approaches can be improved. And I think there is a degree that uh, we can actually look at upstreaming any, ad any additional fixes to V8 that need to be made for Node to make this stuff work more seamlessly. Um, but yeah, so I finally found it. This is the PR where it got knocked down pretty quickly. Um, and Matteo was objecting, who's a TSC member of Node.js. Um, again, kind of based on the performance argument of the with proxy, um, because a lot of packages will directly access process and possibly in tight loops as well. Um, and anyway, so it's just not, not a possible approach. But then... Um, Something that made that possible recently was V8 have released a new, um, well, they have a new type of context API um, that Node.js was able to itself upgrade to use. So Node.js actually no longer uses a JavaScript wrapper uh, for CommonJS anymore. Oh. Uh, just recently it was able to move out of this. Um, I should be able to find it here. Um, uh, and it's basically just a, a V8 equivalent of the same wrapper approach where it's, it's basically a, a context object that gets passed um, instead. Uh, I should be able to find it here somewhere. Uh, does, it, does, this, does this new V8 mechanism apply both to modules and to evaluated scripts? Right, so this, this mechanism actually only applies to uh, evaluated scripts and there isn't an uh, analog of it for modules. It only exists for the script yeah. goal. Uh, so yeah, it, we, we're using a, a compile function API. This is a complete um, uh, replication of the V8 API arguments as well. And this argument here actually allows custom context. Uh, and I think the, the wrapper is done by actually just using custom arguments. Uh, values that can be passed. Um, so, so when you say custom context, uh, what, yeah. what is a context? So it, it, it behaves like a with statement, but at a, at a lower level. So the, it's not a syntactic with, with statement. It's, it's basically just you can create a custom scope that wraps the execution and actually reference an object. And so that's, that's what I've used in, in this PR approach where we have a CJS context object uh, so, yeah. that is able, uh, can you see the screen okay there? Yeah, quick, quick cl clarification about the um, context. Sure. Um, so, so it's basically a compiled function will have this context and it will become a function that you can execute more than once with the same context or is it executed after compiled uh, and then the context is garbage collected? So the context is actually just an object. And what we do is we pass an object to the, um, the compile function. I'm trying to find the line here. Uh, uh, but basically, you pass it as, as an object. And what it will do is it will treat it as if you've written a with statement with that object uh, in the actual um, V8 engine at a, at a low level. So it, it turns that. The property, like the property accesses on that object, become available uh, at a scope level outside the declaration of the function itself. So it's as if you have a var that is before your function. Um, yes. Okay. Perfect. So so if the yeah. on top sequence calls, it's not like like um, 
the, the um, uh, transient variables inside the actual body of the function. Yes. Uh, yeah. So it's it, it's as if it exists outside the function um, just before the global access. So it's sort of like a mock global, and then it'll try the global. Okay. Um, so so if the object that you're providing for the context uh, does not have a particular property uh, that uh, ev that this mechanism that you're showing us will still proceed to try to look up the missing property name on the genuine global. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. So it allows us to accept that global scope lookup um, while still retaining the usual semantics um, of a global lookup, basically. Okay. Um, so, so, so what you're suggesting is that to provide um, uh, to provide process and buffer yes. uh, yeah. in, the, in, in lexical scope, but not yes. on the global object. Um, uh, so, uh, so, it, you know, oh. <laughs> so, uh, so in, in addition to on the global object, and the reason for that is that on the global objects, we can then do a stack detection. Uh, where we say, did you access the global object from a common JS module, or did you access the global object from an ECMAScript module? And if you access it from a common JS module, we can check that by checking the stack in C++. Okay. Uh, so, so as a, as a kludge to get something working for demonstration purposes, yes. Yes. Uh, all sorts of things should be on the table. I just want to make it very, very clear that uh, I have uh, been a guardian on the committee to prevent dynamic scoping from leaking into the semantics. Uh, okay. uh, there's, there's nothing in the semantics left that is sensitive on the caller or e that even lets yes. you detect the caller. Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, I would certainly move to kill anything that tried to introduce that semantics. Right. So yeah, this isn't a, a, a cow path that one would want to pave with any kind of spec approach. Um, Right. But, so, 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 let's, so let's put aside for a moment how you're sure. implementing now and yes. okay. fo focus on what it is you would like to propose to specify, what it is you would like to specify. Okay. Um, so basically the point is, uh, it, it's, I guess one, one should think as well about things is, you know, you want to design for the future and you want to be able to accept certain compromises on the past. And uh, in, in doing that, uh, what we're doing here is opening up the design space of being able to say uh, process and buffer. This, this PR actually still keeps process and buffer uh, as available in ECMAScript modules. It just provides a warning when you access them. Um, and the idea is that we can start to reserve the design space around not necessarily using these globals and that will allow for better semantics in future. So, um, so, so would the globals still exist on the global object? Okay, so we replaced on, on the global object, they do still exist, but as getters, which uh, when you not accessing it from a common JS module, which, you know, in, in five years time will widely be regarded as, um, an entirely legacy deprecated module format. Uh, when you access, uh, these globals right now, it'll warn that it'll still give them to you in future. We would just possibly even throw, um, or we could just return undefined even. So Quick question I ran into a couple of days ago when I was playing with a build that has that. Um, I, I usually do type of process equals uh, object to detect if I'm a node. Uh, yeah. If M type off will throw a warning, uh, I assume if it accesses the global. But then you're saying that, that we're moving towards a path to actually not have it there. Um, yes. So yeah. it's, it's a process in global this. Ouch global this, <laughs> um, would that be the way to detect node in the future? Like using the string process in global this, and hopefully we can find a way to actually change that. 
Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll need to reconsider that pattern. I mean, uh, the, the point is that if we make process available in modules and it works, then that pattern will establish for modules and then we can never remove it ever. Uh, I'm not against removing it, honestly. Like I, I just, no, no, uh, so, yeah, and I appreciate that. But it, so what I'm saying is, yeah, it's, it's to try and push those patterns in other directions. For example, import.meta.environment um, name or, or, or something that provides a, a contextual way of checking these things. Um, yeah. well, I, I had to solve it for myself at least, so it worked. <laughs> Yeah. What, the, what does eval quote process unquote do in your system? If you're in CommonJS, that would access the, the context version, which would do that with style object lookup uh, and you would get the normal process object. If you're in an ECMAScript module, it'll do the lookup to global and it'll then do the stack check, the full slow or full stack check and then either provide a warning or return undefined, depending on where we are in that deprecation cycle. So, so uh, first of all, let me, uh, the stack check is a non-starter, is a mechanism for going into production. Um, what do you, what would you actually want to do going into production? So, um, I don't think there is short of, um, getting like i think the the ideal approach would be a v8 api that allows the thing is we can't even offer different globals because we have to have the same global between common js and ecmascript modules so if Why? we want to provide different global values um that's a non-starter uh unless we did somehow have separate globals but i just i don't see a way for that to be possible um so why, why not have separate globals? I, I think we're, it's too late at this point to get a V8 approach for that all the way down because that's normally, you know, a few months lead time to get that sort of stuff. And at the moment, we were kind of already past that point, unfortunately. Um, it, it could be possible. Uh, I did actually have some discussions with various members of the VA team about having a separate global, um, but because it's something that has no need in browsers, it's difficult to get it prioritized for Node. I don't think it's something that came easily to hand. So I, I did have some brief discussions about that, but nothing. Okay. Nothing uh, uh, who, who just, uh, um, uh, actually, let me let me know um, uh, uh, separately through email uh, who on V8 you were talking to. Um, the um, yeah, so I mean, unfortunately, yeah, it is it is something that's late in the day. It's something that uh, I've been trying to bring up, but most people don't really care at all about this. Um, most people are very uninterested in this and they don't think it's possible. And uh, so it's one of those things that just kind of slips under the radar. And um, I think at the moment, like it's probably 50-50 whether this will be possible. Um, but because of the security properties that it would enable for Node in future, that's why I think it's an important thing to bring up because uh, it, it allows us to get to that place where the ecosystem conventions will work with resolver based security. And otherwise process continues to have access to native bindings, high resolution timers. Uh, you can access all the environment variables. Uh, yeah. So pr process has got the ability to load any, uh, native node binding. So you can get bindings to anything on the operating system, basically, um, just with that one global. The alternative would be to literally deprecate each of those paths individually over the coming years of nodes operation, which I think would effectively be the alternative from a security perspective for those security properties. So it's, we've got the nice opportunity here to kind of just do one quick fix and it's done. Um, but yeah, it's a long shot. So, um, the, 
what so it, it, the node thing that wraps an individual common JS module, the thing that used to be a function that's now this other mechanism that you just showed us, uh, it brings new things into scope specific to that module, uh, in particular require and module. Um, could you put process and buffer into scope using that mechanism so it's just in the in the global scope of common js modules but it's not on the global object yes so um that is what what is done to avoid the stack lookup for performance cost uh in, in this this approach here it uses exactly that um uh if i can find it here uh, this is the wrong so yeah, we, we add in the process and, and buffer into that uh, common JS scope specifically. Okay. Uh, common JS context object, and then we write a uh, buffer onto it and process onto it, and then provide it in, uh, in the CJS loader um, here. So, so in that case, I don't understand why you also need to put them on the global object. So that is because we need to have full backwards compatibility for common JS uh, module users. And people could do things like uh, write, they could change the process in uh, object to instrument it for instrumentation purposes by writing to the global. Uh, they could also access the global directly when checking process. For example, Dash does that. Uh, it, it actually reads uh, process from global.process and uses that version. Uh, so put those backwards compatibility scenarios, that's why we have to keep the global check. Um, and yeah, that, that's the reason for that. I mean, it, and I, I, I'm not, not even sure it would be possible to just deprecate that global check because if we also get a deprecation warning in those cases, um, that would break a lot of things, like Lodash. Um, so I, I did try. Wait, wait, uh, so, no, so hold on. Let's take Lodash specifically. Lodash depends not just on process and buffer being in the global scope. It actually depends on them being properties of the global object. Yes, that's how Lodash does the uh, the check. Uh, Um, oh, oh, the check to detect what platform it's on. Yes, so it's, it accesses it directly off the, the global object and then it in a local variable. I see. Uh, and, and lots of, I mean, third party packages will do that sort of thing. So, I mean, look, I know the stack check is terribly awful and ugly. Um, there are ways that we might be able to optimize it and kind of, it's it's not it's not a, it's not an issue of performance. Performance is the least of my concerns in objecting to the stack lookup. Right. Uh, yeah. It is it is the semantic cost of sensitivity to the caller. Um, right. And that breaks a lot of things. Uh, um, the eval example that I mentioned uh, that for the direct eval, uh, I I believe your answer. If instead we did an indirect eval, we do. Uh, open paren, one comma eval, close paren, open mm -hmm. paren, quote, process, close paren, uh, then we're not, then the module, it's not code in the module that's accessing process. It's mm. the module is simply calling a function that already exists, passing it only a string, and it's the other function that's, that's looking up process. Mm. Yeah, so I think indirect eval would hit the global stack check, uh, which would then be a, a caller based attack. Oh, sorry, uh, what is, tell me what you're checking when you do this global chat stack check. We're checking if the, uh, we're basically going through the script frames uh, to work out if the exact access of the, the global lookup is coming from a common JS module or an ECMAScript module. So the top of stack only, you're not, you're not concerned with anything farther down the stack? 
Well, we are actually, that's, it's always at a stack depth of two because there's JavaScript code in, in the getter. So it, it becomes a, it, but yes, okay. it's always a second so if stack. You do an in, so if you do an indirect eval of an indirect eval of an indirect eval of process. Right, oh, it's always a direct check. It doesn't, you can't, you can't right. fake it. It actually does directly yeah. correspond to so, what it means. Yeah. Right, so what you're doing is stack introspection. I have years of experience with stack introspection in the Java world. Um, yeah. And uh, I firmly believe that, that it cannot be made to work, that for all of these kinds of dilemmas, there is no correct answer. I... I don't think so. I, I th it's, I've actually found it works correctly, completely correctly. Like there let's, is let's, no. Let's, let's take the example oh. I just mentioned. If, if, right? if indirect eval of indirect eval of indirect eval of process gives you the process, then you have not enforced any limitation on access to process. Uh, so are, are you meaning in terms of um, maintaining any security properties of, of the lookup to process or? Yes. Um, right. So the point is, in CommonJS, we have no security properties. Um, there, is, there is no security in CommonJS. What we're focusing on is the security properties of ES modules. Right. And, so I'm, I'm assuming that the, the indirect eval is in an ESM module. Right. Yeah. So I believe that, that you, know, you can create systems in which you um, successfully avoid introducing common JS modules, and then yes. does, does, do any guarantees follow from having excluded common JS modules? Yes, uh, so the process access, so, so if we're asking, if we're stuck with this process stack check, and thanks, this is great to go through because I haven't had anyone else to ver verify it with, especially with uh, Bradley out of action these days, uh, is that the, if you're in an ECMAScript module, the, the, so imagine we're, we're in that, that point where it's been deprecated and it'll do the, the stack check and it'll just return undefined if you try and access global.process and you're not in a common JS module. Uh, I, I believe the only way that you can basically- Oh, 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 oh. The stack check is that you're in a common JS module, not that you're not in an, an ECMAScript module. Yes. Uh, okay, I misunderstood. I misunderstood. Uh, my indirect eval um, attack fails. I was I was assuming the the check was the other way. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, the the check isn't ideal at the moment. Uh, I've actually also spoken to the VA team about an improvement we can do to the check to make sure that we're using unique um, identifiers to make sure we've got the right. Um, identification of, of the script, and uh, I've already been suggested a way to do that better. So basically, if this does land, um, then because at the moment it's just a string-based check um, that could be effectively wrong. Uh, in in the rare cases, um, we're just checking that it's the right ID of of the the source file. Um, Okay. It's, there, there's a possible patch to V8 that, we, that I would work on after this, if this were able to land, that would make it completely um, based on a unique origin data that cannot be um, incorrect, basically. If that makes sense. Okay, now that I understand, sorry I misunderstood before the, the, the check you're doing. Uh, this is a much sure. better check. Uh, it sort of treats common JS as another form of sloppy mode. Right. Um, okay, I'm feeling a lot better about this. Uh, in sloppy mode, we cannot deny sloppy mode access to the global, uh, even with the, the with trick, because there's too many other ways to get a hold of the global. Uh, strict mode plugged all of the other all of the other ways to get a hold of the global. So by by denying the ability to run code in sloppy mode, we were able to build on that to deny access to the global. Uh, you're basically doing the same trick with common JS. You're saying by allowing code to run in common JS, I'm creating, I'm giving it this magic ability to see a process and buffer global, uh, but I'm giving it only to that, 
to that code, nothing else magically gets that ability. So to everyone right. else, they're running in a world that is, that is one in yeah. which there is no pro process and buffer global. Right. It, it would, they still, there are still getters, but the getters would return undefined and there wouldn't be a way to fake that. Um, because that's protected script origin data that's created when the script is initialized. Um, that can't be accessed or changed from Museland. Okay, so now, so now let me, um, okay, so, so, so I think I believe this, that it does have good security properties. Good. Uh, it has some surprising and non-backwards compatible consequences from common JS code. So if in common JS, I do an indirect eval of an indirect eval of process, uh, I would see undefined and not the genuine process because the common JS module is not at the top of the stack. Um, but that's, that's not a security problem. That's a backwards compatibility problem. And probably if that turns out not to be compatible, it's not going to hurt anybody other than attackers. Right. Um, yeah, I'll have to, I haven't tested that uh, case, but I can, I can check that. From, from a backwards compatibility point of view, it doesn't sound like something that would be a common pattern. And uh, the, the most important thing is that anything that's, you know, I guess you have some kind of threshold of backwards compatibility where it's, you know, how likely is it? Uh, and if it's something that's so rare that you have to really construct it to create that case, then we're fine. But usually, even things like so, what I'm also worried about with backwards compatibility is is things like um, users who are doing object dot define property on the global and expecting certain semantics around that. And that's one of the main reasons why I feel it's important to get it into this major release now, the Node 12 release, because just changing process and buffer to be getters as opposed to normal value properties is going to be enough of a breaking change that we can't add that on later in, in Node 12's life cycle, whereas the goal is to unflag modules in Node 12. So that's one of the reasons why it's so pressing to try and merge this in in the next um, two weeks while we still have the possibility of getting pull requests into Node 12 release. Um, and as I say, it's, it's a difficult battle because a lot of people, uh, they don't see any benefit to it and they don't believe that it's going to be backwards compatible. They, they think it's, that it's going to cause problems. And, so uh, I yeah. remember Bradley was explaining that, that uh, there is a process by which um, uh, changes to Node are tested against a large corpus of existing packages. Um, have you tested this against that? I haven't actually, um, but yes, that is, that is the next step. Um, right now, there's a block from the modules group itself where the modules group um, wants to discuss it further, which is happening on Wednesday. And then we'll bring, we'll bring the discussion back to Node Core after next Wednesday. And, uh, and then, yeah, moving to the... Um, to those tests is definitely a next step. I'll speak to um, those who, who run those CI jobs and see if we can get that going, definitely. Um, yeah, so it's just, it's just trying to push it through and, and I guess making uh, the, the node um, reviewers aware of what these properties are and why it might be useful. Um, and I guess also to 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 convince them that it's that it's possible and that this will work out and definitely getting that data will be a huge one on this and showing that it that it can pass the tests of the top um, however many hundreds of packages that that CI check can do um, yeah yeah so that's the next steps definitely okay um, uh, I'm positive on this what are some other reactions. I, I'm as well. It, it seems to seems to be a huge step forward.
Are there any open design questions that we might help settle? Uh, certainly, so if, if anyone wants to review the PR, uh, fur further review is very welcome. Uh, if anyone wants to test it out as well, uh, that's very welcome. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly like, that's the thing is, is just to get eyeballs on this. I, I've discussed it with Bradley a bit, um, but, but yeah, just, just looking to get, um, further review and, uh, and, and any help uh, in, in persuading, uh, on, you know, the, the node review process of the security properties here would be, would be amazing. Uh, I was working on that PR for, um, frozen intrinsics in the, the, the new frozen intrinsics flag. And, uh, I was, I provided the, the documents, I believe it was an SES document on, uh, why you would want to freeze, uh, the intrinsics in a JavaScript environment. And that very much helped um, show that there was a body of research around the arguments there and that it wasn't just me as an individual saying, hey, let's do this. It was actually a whole um, philosophical direction for the project. And I think that helped a lot. Um, so, so some kind of, um, some kind of any, any type of way of indicating that, you know, that there are some security properties here that could be useful for Node as a project in future. Yeah. Um, would be a huge help to the argument because um, it, it is an uphill battle trying to get this through, but uh, yeah, we'll know ne next week, basically. So. Yeah, I think for me, the when I thinking about it as like the way we engineered to sleep to leave sloppy mode behind, um, uh, uh, really helps me understand that this is, you know that this is not causing any semantic difficulties elsewhere. Uh, it's just a, a mode that we hope to be able to put to bed where there's extra magic authority lying around that is otherwise denied. I would hope that um, the getters, um, that, that if we had better platform support, support from V8 for this, that, uh, it would be nice if the properties were absent, except at, when, when looked at by a common JS module. Yeah, it's difficult to tell what, how, how that can, can move forward. I mean, if we have new language semantics to, again, it's, it's that same problem of while we share the same global objects, um, that is a difficult thing to do. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think we probably are stuck with the same global object at this point, um, regardless. Uh, so, but you, you never know what, you know, if, if there are new, new ways of handling this in future or, or what global hooks could open up in V8 in future. Um, but yeah, ideally these getter paths would in, in the long term, eventually be deprecated. I mean, it'll certainly stick around for a while though. This, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's no small thing to, to, to stick these getters in that are gonna lie around for many, many years, so. so um, um, I'm actually, it's, it's very early, like I'm, I'm not gonna be presenting anything at this point, but I have been exploring this idea of uh, first class bindings um, where, where we're actually trying to avoid the reliance on getters um, and to, to extend the ability of how you would import uh, from an ESM module um, to, to make it um, something that you could actually have um, the similar behavior taking place. Um, I have not really explored how, how that would translate to the global, but it's related to um, namespace, dynamic name, namespaces, basically. So it will eventually be, um, you know, a, a point of um, focus for me, at least when I'm doing that work. Um, so I guess the one question that would be helpful um, 
So I, like, I'm trying to find a good way to phrase it because um, like you, you have those getters um, that you're, you're setting on the global object itself. Um, is there, um, like, like if you compare that to how the window proxy object uh, does almost the same behavior, um, is the implementation comparable in, in that regard? Uh, so, I, I think that was, I guess, the window proxy approach was kind of like what we tried in the first version, which was to just have a global proxy. And maybe we will end up with um, the global being a proxy and node at some point in future by default. Uh, I don't think the global is by default a proxy right now in Node.js. Uh, if it ever does, and proxy performance in V8s, is so good that that's really not a problem, which I guess we're getting very close to these days. Um, yeah, that, that's very true. Might be possible to modify it. But yeah. So, so assuming that we, that that the the thing to be specified does include the getters, what would the specification say as to what the getters are testing? I would hope that uh, what the getters are testing is becomes a something that never has to be done again, and I would not want it specified that stack check. Yeah, it's all, you're yeah. you're you're creating behavior here. You're yes. crea you're creating and, and immediately deprecating it, and then pretending it never happened and not telling anyone okay. that it ever happened. The <laughs> If all common JS modules actually disappear from the ecosystem within five years, I would be very surprised. Yeah, we're looking at about 10 years. So. Okay. Uh, the, the interoperation with the legacy needs to be carefully designed, specified, needs to have a semantics, needs to be analyzable. Um, having a semantics of what happens at runtime that can't be analyzed uh, is itself um, problematic. I, 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 yes, I, I certainly appreciate that. Um, ideally, semantic would be um, the ideally the semantic would be the rule, which is that global dot process and global dot buffer are available in common JS modules, um, but not in ECMAScript modules where they will just be undefined getters. So, so the question is, what does it mean to be available in? We need uh, to unpack available in because functions right. in one module call functions in another module all the time. You're, you're in lots of things so simultaneously. The, 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 benefit, the benefit we have here is that in means a direct or indirect evaluation anywhere within the source text of a common JS module uh, that is not um, running through any type of VM or Realm constructor that's altering the evaluation. So, so let's, let's take an, another example. Uh, if code in a common JS module does a reflect dot get um, on the global with the string process, what happens? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think it'll work. OK, that's good. Um, so a static way of thinking about what's being specified here. Let me try it out and you can tell me how it differs from what you have in mind. Sure. Is that um, within common JS modules, every syntactic property lookup, uh, meaning every dot, every square bracket that's looking up a property has the magic behavior that those property lookups 
see the process and buffer properties as having those magic values. Um, but it's, but the, the magic is in the semantics we attribute to the dot and square bracket, the syntactic property lookups, and therefore it's, it's, it's a lexical or static um, uh, issue, not a dynamic testing and computation issue. So unfortunately, uh, if, yeah, you, I guess we could do, it, it affects dynamic, dynamic global property access as well, because if you were to access um, through a, a string named process and you didn't know beforehand, you know, so dynamic property access does but the check. But, but only yeah. dynamic property access that uses a dot or square bracket where the dot or square bracket appears syntactically inside the common JS module. That's what I'm trying to verify. Yes, yeah, a hundred percent. And it has to be the exact global object. It won't work for any other object. Uh, I guess you could basically read those getters off the global object and relocate the getters themselves. Uh, and then you'd have access to this magical piece of code, which would effectively be a new piece of functionality in your JS environment, which would allow you to effectively now have a function that can tell the difference between a common JS module and an ECMAScript module. So maybe that's, that's the biggest risk is exposing that, that functionality in a way that can be read off with um, object or get own property descriptor and, and potentially um, moved around. But again, it would only tell you what you already knew in terms of are you in a common JS module or are you not? Um, even if you were to relocate those getters and, and call them directly in different contexts. That makes sense? Um, I, I do have a question um, on the context of, a, of a, like a VM context, right, in, in Node. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe uh, at a, an earlier uh, time I tried um, and made, maybe didn't make the conclusion. I, I can't remember if, if I'm right or wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that when I used the context object that had a prototype, um, it basically exposed it as an object that didn't have a prototype within the context. Um, is that even uh, true? Like, it has been a very, very long time, so I could get, be getting this very wrong. Uh, but it's kind of like how window behaves in the browser, right? So window has, uh, you know, all these, uh, probably there's a prototype. Uh, like, I'm not sure if they changed it over time. Uh, but now it appears as a flat thing. Um, however, the global in node has, um, you know, a deep prototype chain that, that reaches all the way. You can inspect it all the way to... Um, event target or event, um, like the event, um, um, you know, prototype that gives it the ad listeners. Um, in Node? Uh, yeah, so, so the global object extends from the event um, target or whatever, it, whatever it's called that has the ad listener, remove listener uh, methods on it. Uh, so those are, you know, if you, if you really look in the pr prototype chain of the global object, you will, see all those levels there. Um, in the browser, now you get this flat object, just like the console is now a flat namespace, right? Um, so, so my question is, would, would uh, just moving towards the direction of having a flat um, global be maybe a step towards um, optimizing the behavior of the global properties that you want to do? And the second thing is, if context has this magical way to hide um, deep prototypes of the context object itself, um, maybe there is a, an optimization there um, that could be useful. I'm, I'm not sure if the context object does prototype chain lookup. I think it might even. Um, I'm not sure what, what V8 does there. It's worth verifying. Um, but we do do it 
in the way that we're using it here with an object with an empty prototype, which is obviously, yeah, always nice to avoid um, extra performance in the uh, non-entry case. Um, I didn't know the global extended from event emitter. Um, that's that was boring. a project two weekends ago. Okay. Uh, I did an interrogator of global, and when mm -hmm. I ran it out, I saw that you know that there was the chain leading up to the event um, to the prototype okay. where you have the add listener remove listener. Uh, uh, let me uh, just let me just make sure that you're not falling into a trap that I've fallen into multiple times. Um, the uh, when I first started writing common JS modules, I and I saw that the that from within a module the top level this was bound. Um, I assumed that it was bound to the global object, and it turns out the top level this to a common JS module is something other than the global object. Yeah. So uh, I'm actually running the code uh, to try to see if I can. Uh... Yeah, I, I think it just it extends object prototype. I don't think it's an event emitter. Luckily, yeah. <laughs> it's been no. very worrying. Yeah. So so uh, let let me take a few minutes just to make sure I'm gonna double check my code, uh, and then I'm gonna come back with the answer in a few minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, Does, yeah, I I don't want to take up too much more of your time on this topic, um, but thanks for um, yeah. digging in. Me. If you're interested in the code, it's basically a function here in the getter, which is at the moment we're, we're using the source name itself, the actual name of the source file. And then there's this kind of private C++ function, which is only available from Node.js side, where you say how deep in the stack to read the source name of the file. And so we're just going one, one further than the current depth of the getter itself, which is the, the, the syntactical access of the getter. Uh, and it's getting the source name of that. And ES modules are currently URL based. So this check works, but this is a terrible check, uh, which will be replaced with a, a V8 approach of actually checking the, the origin ID and making sure that it is corresponds to the exact ID of a, car, a common JS module, which I have an approach that I'm going to work with V8 on if this gets in. Um, but basically, it's a, it's a cow path to be paved here. Um, yeah, so I think that the syntactical wording makes sense in terms of get as being syntactical. Well, in terms of the, the, the internal get operation is the thing that's syntactic. Um, it's okay. Um, I think this is a good direction. I'm very worried about what this turns into in terms of a spec change that can support this directly. Um, uh, Cause I, th I think that, you know, looking up the stack has to die. Um, uh, so we need some, some spec mechanism and some direct support of the platform. Uh, doing it this way in order to get this thing going, I think is, is now that I understand it, I think is fine. Um, if you have any ideas, please do share, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, the VA team probably is not adequately allergic to stack introspection because they are not thinking in terms of the security properties that we're thinking in terms of. And de debugging work is always a priority. So the more um, information there is for debugging, the better. Um, so yeah. yeah. The, the debugger has meta level access to the computation. So having the right, debugger. I mean, the, the stack API that we're using is effectively a debugging API, is what, what allows. Yes. Yeah. What is the name of the stack API you're using? Uh, if you look in the V8 header file, it's called uh, current stack trace on the stack trace namespace. Wow. OK. Thanks so much. If anyone has any, any questions further, feel free to get in touch. And if you want to review or have a look at it or, or leave comments, it's very welcome. OK. Uh, thank you. And uh, certainly feel free to stick around in this and future meetings. Sure, thanks. 
Uh, I'll, I'll stick around for a bit now, definitely. Okay. Um, uh, so let's discuss um, what some other uh, topics are. Um, uh, I should take a look at what it is that I had announced in email. Um, so just to verify, um, I guess I, I, I was making uh, like, um, like a, I, I drew a conclusion on something and I got confused. It wasn't really um, intentionally looking into it. So I got it wrong, actually. Okay. So I apologize. Thank, thanks for investigating. Thanks. So, um, uh, so a topic that I have is uh, to talk about uh, the relationship of SES and uh, uh, TC53. Uh, TC53 is a new standards uh, technical committee under ECMA uh, that's focused on um, uh, uh, JavaScript for, well, it's focused on devices, um, uh, but their act and their, their actual focus is on JavaScript for devices, uh, devices and wearables, so embedded, uh, IoT, all these, all those buzzwords. Um, but in any case, um, uh, there's a particular JavaScript engine uh, that we've been using at Agoric uh, that we just met with um, the, you know, the main architects of this morning um, uh, called XS. And we were uh, comparing the um, ways in which we want to, you know, we're trying to subset uh, JavaScript for security purposes and the kinds of things that they could profitably omit from a JavaScript runtime engine um, uh, in order to fit into smaller devices. Um, and, you know, and, and other ways in which um, the IoT needs and the security needs seem to be aligned. Uh, so I could, um, I could talk more about that. Um, okay. Um, uh, let's see. So, uh, the first thing is I'm going to, chat. So over there, I wrote uh, in response to a message uh, from uh, uh, Peter Hottie, the um, uh, one of the uh, XS um, architects. Um, uh, I wrote that uh, in order to have a specification not of SES uh, at, um, in as an API for um, uh, not, I'm sorry, not in terms of specifying an API for creating a SES environment out of a full JavaScript environment, uh, but rather just focused on uh, trying to specify what the resulting SES environment would be in such a way that, that you could build an engine that was just a standalone implementation of S SES uh, omitting all the rest of JavaScript. Uh, so um, I presented that at TC53. They found it, um, all of TC3 found the idea that for embedded, um, uh, there is, there's no utility in supporting any of the JavaScript outside of SES. Um, let's see, I'm going to share my screen and then share a document. Okay, so these are some quick notes that I put together uh, following uh, the meeting. Um, uh, so uh, the alignment between the, the um, you know, we were basically talking about uh, what's needed to get the engineering effort uh, to actually have a, an excess that's specialized for SES. And from our Agoric's perspective, 
and XS that it's a plausible thing for us to be running on blockchains. Um, uh, so so uh, it's very exciting that the same set of changes seem to make um, the engine more suitable for both uh, niches. Um, so uh, so uh, XS um, is already set up so that uh, you can configure it at build time with regard to what components of JavaScript you want at runtime. Um, so the, so the, the main issue of just omitting things outside of SES, they would just do by revising their configuration options uh, because currently they don't line up uh, uh, perfectly with the uh, distinction between SES and non-SES. Um, uh, let's see, what's not shown in my notes here is, uh, which I'll add right now, is... Um, uh, we talked a lot about compartments. Compartments would be a new mechanism for them. Um, uh, it sounds like it would not be a new mechanism that's difficult for them. Um, the, I'm going to, to do this and I'm going to So the main thing that came up that diverged, that caused a difference from the way I've been mostly thinking about things is that SES and realms are, are, are the thing that we've gotten settled is the semantics of runtime evaluation. So, you know, e eval and then the evaluate uh, method on um, the realm object and uh, the function constructor and all of that. So we've, we've done all this engineering for safe runtime evaluation of code, inc including calculated strings. And uh, we're now figuring out what we want to do for modules. Um, uh, the typical configuration of XS omits any runtime evaluator um, uh, for reasons we can all understand. Uh, and, and only supports uh, modules. And uh, they support uh, ECMAScript modules, not CommonJS modules. And uh, the, the normal way they support them is they do all of the module initialization and linking, um, oh, sorry, all the module, no, evaluation and linking uh, at build time and then they snapshot the resulting heap uh, and uh, turn it into uh, read um, immutable objects, really immutable in our sense. Um, uh, their interest in immutability, um, uh, re I mean, really purity in our sense, their interest in purity uh, is because uh, essentially if it's pure, then you can put it in ROM. And from in their, in, in IOT, uh, um, RAM is, is much more expensive than ROM. You can afford much more ROM space than you can afford RAM space. Um, uh, that fits well with security because um, uh, if you have smaller RAM space, you also have a smaller state space to be reasoning about. Um, that's, that's, that's more of an, I mean that more as an, of an, as an analogy or suggestive rather than anything um, uh, but, um, but in any case, so they purify their, they have this, this ability to run the full XS engine, um, in at build time without access to the devices that would be available at runtime, uh, do, uh, run initialization code for that purpose and then snapshot the entire heap, um, and make that pure as well. Um, and all, the, the snapshotting and making pure is um, done by magic. It's not done by a language-based mechanism. It's done by a configuration option that the XS engine knows directly about. Um, uh, and then the um, remaining state that, that was outside the snapshot, they can, they can by configuration exempt certain pieces of code from that snapshotting. Um, 
uh, then uh, those things are the things that then proceed to run um, with mutable state at runtime. Um, so our pure modules and our pure loader fit very well with their pure modules. Um, uh, um, a possible proposal issue for the committee is uh, we've been having um, uh, an interesting time trying to um, define the static checking rules that can, that can by static checking ensure that normal JavaScript mode in a module is only exporting pure stuff. Um, one could imagine proposing a mechanism such that a module declares that it's only creating pure state and where the platform itself somehow enforces it by means that cannot be currently expressed in the language. Um, that would certainly um, reduce a lot of complexity from our point of view and, and make code much more natural to write. You wouldn't have to sprinkle hardened calls everywhere. Um, uh, we also talked about Jesse. Um, uh, one of the things that I thought was a nice perspective is there are always tinier devices. Um, uh, you know, the, as, as we succeed at doing um, uh, circuits at sl smaller and smaller scales, it doesn't just mean that we always have more transistors to play with. It also means that we can build machines that are ever smaller uh, and that are therefore still constrained. And for some of the ones that they've actually encountered, uh, Jesse would be useful. Uh, there was actually an important uh, use case for which XS was lost because it was too large, but Jesse would have been fine with. Um, and for Jesse, their sense is not to do it by configuring a subset, um, but rather uh, um, uh, port their experience from XS rather than porting code. Uh, Jesse is small enough that just building an engine to run Jesse from scratch uh, would seem to be the more useful approach. Um, and uh, it also enables them to drop some runtime state from the Jesse heap that standalone Jesse wouldn't need, but Jesse within SES or within, yeah, would still need such as um, uh, the bookkeeping to enable properties to be mutable. Jesse to a first approximation has no mutable properties. Um, the biggest surprise um, is that uh, we've, we at Agoric have been wrestling with the issue of how to do persistent object state. Um, uh, and we, the, our community, the object capability uh, community has actually wrestled with this for a very, very long time. There's essentially uh, two extreme positions um, uh, that we've gone back and forth between. Uh, one is orthogonal persistence, where you just mash, you just mask machine crashes. You just snapshot uh, state and then restore from snapshot in a way that computation simply continues um, as if the crash had never happened um, versus um, the um, uh, uh, state API where there is, uh, which is generally how things like object relational mappings and, and anything that where, I mean, pretty much the entire JavaScript world is always any state that it saves, it's actually talking to some API to save state because objects don't persist. Um, and, uh, but the, the explicit API approach uh, for object capabilities would still be one that traverses an object graph and is doing an explicit serialization of, a, of an explicitly traversed object graph. I'm very attracted to orthogonal persistence. 
Uh, it makes many things much easier to, about, uh, to reason about. It makes code much smaller and more obvious. Uh, it has some interesting costs, which I'll get back to. Um, but um, uh, it turns out that the XS engine already has all the, the core engineering needed to support object persistence. Um, uh, and the reason is because they did the snapshotting thing to be able to execute up to some computation state at build time, uh, take the resulting state, put it into ROM, and then proceed at runtime uh, 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 in a heap that's already populated by those ROMed objects. Uh, what I didn't know until the uh, meeting today is that the freezing, the mechanisms to freeze those so that they're put into ROM is completely separate from the mechanism to snapshot. So snapshotting to a, um, uh, such that the, the restoring from snapshot restores all of the mutability, which is what you need for masking crashes. Um, uh, they've already got all the core mechanism from that. For that, they don't have promises. They don't have a few other obscure types um, uh, uh, because they haven't needed them yet, uh, and they don't have job queues because job queues in the XS architecture comes from the host. Um, uh, for us, we would add persistent um, job queues, the promise queue, um, uh, and uh, in terms of their architecture, there was no reason why they didn't per, uh, persist promises. They just had no need to do so since they were computing without jobs. Um, so I don't mean to be going so much into holding forth mode. So, so you know, please, um, you know, stop me with discussion as as you'd like. But um, uh, two other aspects that we talked about, uh, all of which seemed to come out very well, is de determinism. Uh, for blockchain, it's not so much that we want to mask crashes in a single execution going forward. It's that we need deterministic replication where all of the, in the blockchain world, they call them validators, the, the, um, uh, the participants in the blockchain world that are running a replica of the computation such that all the replicas are cross-checked against each other. Um, uh, all of the validators would need to be proceeding forward lockstep computing exactly the same outcomes from exactly the same uh, inputs, um, uh, despite the fact that some va that different validators will crash and have to restart at, um, uh, at um, unpredictable times, and obviously at different times from each other. So the JavaScript has um, very little dynamic non-determinism. Um, uh, the, uh, there's the legacy date, which gives you access to the current time. There's math.random, um, and for the, uh, and there's shared array buffer for doing shared memory multi-threading, which we're never going to do on blockchain. Um, uh, other than that, there's really, um, no current dynamic non-determinism in JavaScript that I can think of. Um, uh, there's um, spec non-determinism and platform non-determinism in the sense that the spec allow, has, some, has purposeful, purposefully some wiggle room in it. Um, uh, and the different implementations of JavaScript make use of that wiggle room. So they differ from each other in semantically significant ways. Um, and uh, what um, this is the case with WASM as well, and the WASM on blockchain folk uh, have already um, uh, figured out sort of what the right standardization interaction is 
to uh, deal with that issue, which is um, the, uh, the WASM specification has a tiny bit of wiggle room uh, that's absolutely necessary for the performance that WASM needs. Specifically, they allowed themselves wiggle room on the bit representation of a floating point NAN because different platforms uh, do that differently and there's no way to normalize it without a performance cost that WASM in general is not willing to pay. Uh, WASM on blockchain is perfectly happy to pay that performance cost and more because the language execution is not your bottleneck on blockchain. Um, uh, so they just picked a NAND format. So the general thing that's going on here, and they use the right terminology for it, is starting from the agreed spec, they created an agreed refinement of the spec. So it's a new spec, but the new spec is a refinement of the existing spec, where all of the unambiguous choices that the new spec makes are choices that are allowed within the ambiguity of the original spec. Um, uh, I would want us to proceed in the same manner um, because uh, XS is the engine that we would be interested in running in such a manner. Um, and I think it's the only existing plausible candidate for anybody to use for this purpose. Uh, I would start that refinement biased towards whatever it is that XS actually does, uh, um, as long as what it's doing is not, you know, bizarre or unpleasant for some reasons, and we didn't run into any of those. Um, the, um, the one that makes the biggest change from existing JavaScript, um, which I was very surprised to get immediate agreement on, uh, is the text of platform generated error messages. The spec is deterministic with regard to uh, what conditions trigger a platform thrown error. Con it's, it's unambiguous with regard to what error is thrown, but then it's completely up to the spec as to what the contents of the string are that supposedly explain the error to a programmer. Um, uh, refining that by simply writing into the refined spec the, t the text content of presumably English error messages is not something that any of us uh, want to do. Um, so I suggested that uh, there, that um, XS, at least when configured for these purposes, uh, all of the platform generated errors have an error code as their um, uh, error string. And then the programming environments built around XS uh, use a side table that's not part of the execution that look up the error codes in order to present um, uh, human meaningful error message strings. Um, uh, and I'll see, let me I'll just enumerate since, um, and I'll, I'll write it into the document as I enumerate, the sources of non-determinism, uh, spec non-determinism, there's the for in loop, um, uh, if you, in, uh, uh, it, if the object being enumerated, it, uh, is, if its properties change during the enumeration, uh, the order in which the properties are enumerated is not specified. And that's because the, the different implementations differ from, with regard to that uh, in ways that they're not willing to fix for performance reasons. There's array.prototype.sort where the spec on purpose does not specify what sorting algorithm is used, um, uh, but uh, because of the you know, nature of JavaScript, uh, it's very, very observable what sorting algorithm is used. Uh, so they just use a quick sort modified for stability, um, uh, and I'm fine hap specifying that. Uh, we already talked about error codes.
that's actually all I can remember in terms of uh, remaining specification wiggle room in the SES subset of JavaScript. So the error codes, that's not actually non-deterministic, right? It's just going to vary across implementation. Right. Well, so that's what so I'm, spe I'm distinguishing between uh, spec non-determinism versus dynamic non-determinism. Ah, okay, sure. Right. So all the three of these that I've that I've listed are uh, spec non-determinism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the dynamic non-determinism is like uh, date and math dot random um, and shared array buffers, uh, all right. of which are omitted from SES. Um, oh, and then there's the unsolvable one, um, which the which is out of memory. Um, uh, you're no one's going to um, specify a memory semantics such that um, the occurrence of an out of memory condition will be deterministically uh, agreed on. Um, so uh, that the out of memory took us into a discussion of gas, um, and uh, which is specific to blockchain use, uh, which is uh, um, a blockchain computation. All the blockchains meter the computation. So uh, there's some kind of budget represented by a number uh, uh, called the amount of gas, and as computation proceeds, the number gets decremented. And then if the number reaches zero before the computation completes, then the transaction in which the computation is happening is aborted with essentially no side effects. So all side effects are, um, are hypothetical uh, until either the transaction completes or aborts. Um, and for JavaScript on a blockchain, the natural transactional boundary is the term. Um, uh, so uh, if you run out of gas in the midst of a turn, then the turn is aborted and the engine falls back to the, to the uh, state as of the previous turn boundary. That would be a uh, reasonable way to do gas. Um, uh, uh, gas, by the way, just not sure if these, the font sizes here are, are Oh, I think I'm actually not using it. Number six. Yeah, the um, gas and determinism are, are two separate heads here, headings here. Um, uh, gas is not within determinism. Um, uh, but actually, gas has its own determinism issue, which is um, uh, you, you, the gas has to satisfy um, two hard requirements and one soft requirement. Um, uh, it has to prevent uh, infinite resource drains. So it should not be possible for user code to engage in an infinite loop without consuming gas. Um, and therefore, it should be impossible to express non-terminating computation. Um, uh, uh, and all of the validators must deterministically agree at the point in computation, actually, as to whether the computation ran out of gas and in which transaction. And anything that does that is actually going to have complete agreement down to the, to the, to the fine grain as to precisely when they ran out of gas, uh, even though all that's observable is the transaction boundaries. Um, uh, so this is, this, this is specific to blockchain. The, the gas concern doesn't affect IoT or any of the other anticipated uses of excess at all. Um, but I was glad to find out that the engineering needed to insert um, uh, the decrement operations uh, so the JavaScript code could not do an infinite loop are straightforward in the XS engine. Um, uh, and likewise, uh, you have to instrument uh, memory allocation. Um, 
the um, uh, uh, and that again is uh, uh, that's actually even more straightforward with the XS engine. Uh, so that's my report from uh, how XS relates to SES and JavaScript. I'm sorry, and and uh, and Jesse. Um, so the, the issue about having a magic operation for purifying module state is, um, probably the, the, the thing that's the most surprising change from what this group has been doing anyway. Any reactions to the prospect of, of specifying a magic purify primitive and actually getting direct support for it into the language? How much easier would that be compared to uh, you know, our approach of defining the ESLint rules for a purity checker and things like that. So uh, in, um, in the Jesse repository, uh, mm -hmm. Michael Fig and I have been going back, oh, and Dan Connolly have been going back and forth in a thread about uh, the static checking rules for inserting Harden. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's finding it painful. He has a challenge example for me that I have not looked at yet, so I don't have a response yet. Uh, but I can, it's certainly plausible that once you start using it, that it turns out to be notationally more painful than I expect. The, the reason why I'm expect, I was expecting, I am expecting it not to be that painful is I've just been manually writing Jesse code, manually hardening things to the point that I'm confident in my own head that everything's hardened. But of course, any static checking rule is going to be more severe than what I think I'm confident of in my own head. Right. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so Michael Fig has proposed uh, two other uh, ways to to intervene uh, in order to um, uh, create. create uh, guaranteed hardened surfaces. Um, uh, as I'm saying this, I'm realizing that, that I am confusing the conversation. The Jesse static checking rules are doing two things. They're ensuring that modules are pure and they're ensuring that exposed API surfaces of objects created by Jesse are transitively hardened. Right, which is a requirement of being pure, right? Hardening is a requirement of being pure, but we're requiring hardening a lot more than is required for purity. And the notational pain that Michael is running into is all about the additional hardening of runtime state that is not needed for pure modules. Uh, and therefore, a built-in platform mechanism for purifying modules, rather than using our static checking approach, buys us much less than I was thinking a moment ago. You still have to, most of the harden um, calls in order to harden API surface would still be needed with our static checking uh, plus harden approach. The uh, two interventions um, is he has suggested a, um, a stronger form of harden that he calls immunize, uh, where uh, what immunize does is in the walk, whenever it sees a function, it 
replaces the function in place in the object graph uh, with a wrapper of the function um, uh, and where the what where what uh, where the wrapper of course is hardened but the more interesting thing is the wrapper immunizes all incoming arguments and outgoing return results. So it has the kind of transitivity that we associate with the membrane, but it's not intermediating to uh, a, an object graph. It's just sort of doing direct surgery in place. Um, I uh, expressed on the issue thread, uh, and what is still true is that I'm profoundly disturbed by um, the prospect of doing the surgery in place, but I so far haven't found anything wrong with it. And um, uh, as, as um, I, and you know, if there's nothing wrong with it, there's nothing wrong with it. So, so, um, so let's conti continue to examine it. But if it turns out to, um, well, we need to find out what the costs actually are. Um, and then evaluate it based on costs and benefits. Uh, the other intervention is something I raised that Michael Fig uh, took farther, uh, which is we can define a language like Jesse that uh, is written in the Jesse syntax, but does not require the calls to harden be written by the programmer. Rather, this language, which uh, Michael Fig called Jessa with a A at the end, um, uh, a better name solicited, um, uh, that uh, ba basically a, a, a source source rewrite of Jessa into Jesse that essentially can be uh, have the form of our static checking rules where everything that we would have rejected uh, uh, in our static checking rules because of the absence of a harden. Instead, the rewrite would just insert the harden. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so then in, when you're writing Jessa, you're not writing in a subset of JavaScript because things are harder than they would be if the program was written in JavaScript. But any execution that doesn't run into the lack of mutability, any execution that doesn't, for example, try to mutate a property that has been um, uh, made um, uh, immutable because of Harden or, or, or because of the rewrite, uh, any computation that doesn't run into those things actually would run the same way. So you have a sort of preservation of functionality under lack of error, but not preservation of enforcement or uh, uh, execution under error. Uh, this is what I've called in the past a fail stop subset of a language. And I, I think it's still a good category to keep in mind. Uh, it, it is from, from previous work, I can uh, um, say that it's uh, definitely a, a, a kind of subset it's useful to be thinking in terms of. Um, and uh, then uh, Michael Fig, um, uh, uh, what he's actually doing in the Jessica repository, the uh, compiler for Jesse, is he's not using, he's not writing code in Jesse directly. He's writing code in the Jesse subset of TypeScript and using TypeScript to rewrite it to Jesse. Mm -hmm. So his uh, final recommendation on the rewrite path is Tessie which is you basically write in the TypeScript's, TypeScript form of Jesse, but, you, uh, but since you're using a read writer anyway, and since your source code already is not in JavaScript, uh, just um, overload the rewrite mechanism to also insert the calls to Harden. And, and, and I should just, since I'm explaining it this way, I should just mention he's not inserting calls to Harden, he's inserting calls to Immunize, but that's, that's an orthogonal matter. So regarding the, the first of those discussion points, I, I share your concern. I've been following it a little bit. Um, the, 
the in place mutation is the, is the kind of thing where the where it invalidates certain classes of programs that I think we would like not to invalidate. Uh, can you give an example? Yeah, it's it's actually very similar to the one that um, that you presented on the on the issue. The idea being that you have either an array or an object where the, where the properties you know in in that graph is a function. And if that function has a reference inside the module, say that you would want to be able to do a comparison between the direct reference and then the the value at the right place inside the object graph. Uh, could you uh, share your screen and um, uh, write the example that you have in mind? Oh boy, I'm not sure it's possible. Uh, I don't see a screen sharing option at all. Uh, you're you're in Zoom. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so in my Zoom, at the at the bottom middle, there's a green icon called Share. Ah, okay. Is that, is that the right thing? I I found it. Is this? Okay. I I am now seeing what I, I suspect is your screen. I see a little edit text edit box. Oh, good. So I actually I'm trying the Zoom whiteboard. Oh. So. Oh, I didn't know Zoom had a whiteboard. I, I didn't either. Um, okay, so I need to pull up. Well, I suppose it's it's actually fairly simple, right? So we could have I'm going to want that to be much bigger. Um, and then I guess we'll use this not a return. We want it. Um, just as a trivial example, and I suppose foo itself in this case would be So there's been a lot of variations uh, uh, um, as the thread has continued. Um, I'm going to speak for the most conservative variation uh, since Michael's not on the call and just see if, um, uh, if we still have the problem. Uh, in the most conservative variation, uh, you wouldn't be allowed to say uh, let foo at top level. You would have to say const foo. And then the right hand side of the equals uh, would need to be within an immunize. So foo would already be not the, the um, lambda that you wrote, but a function that wraps it. Mm, okay. So in this case, that would still work. Okay. And then uh, the const array, just to, to complete it, um, in this conservative form, you would do the immunize there. And then you wouldn't need it here. Right. Well, it would have no effect, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, well, if there's never a reference to the function expression itself, Then I think we're okay. I'm not. I'm not convinced that it, that even with this, that it is impossible to get such a reference, though. So I think the the case for plausibility of immunize uh, is for standalone Jesse, for Jesse code that's interacting with SES code. Um, uh, it can interact with an object that's frozen, but not immunized, where that object already contains a, a function that's not immunized. 
-hmm. And then that object ends up in a graph of Jesse objects that Jesse would like to immunize. Um, and you can just say, well, that's not what immunize is for. And that's a, that's a valid position. Um, but um, I don't, I don't think Harden has that interoperation problem or it has it less severely. SES code could purposely want to keep objects non-frozen. And then if they end up in a graph of objects that SES code, they don't even have to bring Jesse into it, uh, wants to harden, then SES code hardening them will, will proceed to harden uh, objects that might have been created with the intention that they not get frozen. And uh, that's just a, um, you know, something we're, we're um, that's a coordination issue that we're just willing to, um, admit right. the price of programming in SES. Uh, basically on, only frozen objects can be defensive. So therefore, there's no way to defensively remain unfrozen. Yes, and, I agree with that. Yeah, um, but I think that, so I think that that interoperates perfectly well with Jesse code that's using Harden. And I think it interoperates poorly with Jesse code that uses immunize, but not in a way that hurts the SES code. Uh, it's a way that causes the immunize to fail. And if the immunize fails, even Harden can fail. If the immunize fails or if Harden fails, in both cases, we say that none of the security guarantees follow if the operation failed. So there's no contradiction there either. Yeah, again, I agree. It's uh... It's an explicit recognition of, of, of being outside the box. Yeah, yeah. If you're, if you're allowing objects you don't control to be inside a graph that you're immunizing, you've probably done something wrong. Okay. So in this strict form, then, I, I, I have to withdraw the objection for now. Um, Okay, um, I will bring uh, this, the recording of this meeting um, uh, to Michael's attention as well. Um, and it is now past 2.50. And um, uh, uh, I'm adjourning the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.